Hello everyone, welcome back to Daikin Cuts. So today we'll be taking a look at a really interesting number theory problem from the Korea Math Olympiad 2023. This problem looks deceptively simple but it's actually quite tricky. So without further ado, let us take a look at the problem. So as I mentioned, this is problem 5 from the Korean Math Olympiad 2023. Now note that the Olympiad consists of two parts and each part has four problems. So problem 5 is supposed to be the easiest problem from the second set. Well, let's take a look at the question. Find all positive integers n such that 5n plus sigma n equals 2n plus 8. So that's it to the question, a short and sweet problem. Now, when we are faced with a problem like this, what is the first natural thing to do? Well, naturally you want to recall what is the definition of phi n and sigma n. Typically for this type of problems, it's very useful to suppose that n has the following form. So its prime factorization is p1 to the alpha 1 dot 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 pr to the alpha r. And what is phi n? Phi n is the number of integers from 1 to n which are relatively prime to it. And the formula for this is given by the following. Well, there are a few equivalent ways of writing it. Uh, this is one of the, the equivalent way. And usually it's quite uh, easy to remember what's the formula, right? For those that are not familiar, well, the way I like to remember it is for each prime, basically, uh, p minus 1 over p fraction of the numbers are going to be relatively uh, prime compared to p. So then I just multiply the fractions and take that to multiply against n and this is the formula for phi n. So of course this uh, mnemonic, I'm not going to bother to uh, justify it rigorously, this is just to help me remember this formula. And what's the formula for sigma n? Well. This is one of the ways that you can write. So sigma n, to recap, it is the sum of all the divisors of n. So over here, you can see that if you expand out the products, you take sum of uh, one of the p1 to some power times p2 to some power and so on until pr to some power. And the power you choose will be between 0 to alpha 1 so and between 0 to alpha 2 and so on. So uh, each of the term here will match exactly with one of the factors of n. Yeah, so this is a very useful formula for sigma n. Okay, so I'm sure this might be uh, familiar with, to with many of you. So this is just warm up, right? And how will you go about solving this problem? Well, naturally, you might want to see if you can, you know, write substitute in these two expressions and see if you can perform some algebraic manipulation to put restrictions on uh, the value of p's or the value of alpha. Well, but unfortunately, I'm not able to actually get this to work. So we have to try, try and think of another approach. Well, so if you stare at this a bit further, what is common for this type of problems is that typically you notice that sigma n is usually quite large and 2n plus 8 is actually quite small. If you think about it, Sigma n uh, is the sum of the divisors, right? n is already a divisor. So the sigma n is already going to be bigger than n. And maybe it is frequently bigger than twice of n. You know, that seems like a possibility. After all, you have this part is bigger than p1 to the alpha 1. This part is bigger than p2 to the alpha 2. You multiply all that together. It seems that it can beat n by quite a bit of factor. So maybe if there are too many different primes and if the powers are big then maybe just maybe sigma n is going to be much bigger than 2n you know and this will then ensure that there's no solution for such n so the trick here is perhaps this side just double of n plus a constant seems quite small relative to sigma n so uh, this is a pretty common trick, by the way, for this type of questions. There's another one, another question that I've done before that involves uh, a trick like this. So, with that in mind, let us now take a look at the actual solution. So, how would you solve this problem? Well, 
I mean, you can't escape defining n this way and recalling the formula for phi n and sigma n. But now we know that we want to try and show that the left side is bigger than right side in most of the situations. So let's expand out what the left side looks like. And you will see why this expansion is useful in a bit. So let me explain this expansion. So basically, if you take the factor 1 from each bracket, you will get this expression back itself. Now, then you can choose one of the brackets. You take the minus 1 over pi. And for the rest of brackets, you take 1. So this will give you a minus sum of terms that are basically uh, this products here, but one of the power will be reduced by 1. You understand what I'm saying? So, for example, if you take minus p1 times 1 times 1 times 1 dot dot, then times this thing, you'll basically get this expression except the power for p1 is alpha 1 minus 1, because you divided by p1 here. And of course, you can choose any of the 1 over pi. So, you'll get minus the sum of terms, where 1 of the power is reduced by 1. Now, similarly, you can choose two of the terms to be 1 over pi, uh, and then the rest of the terms to be 1. So if you take that, then two of the terms will have their powers reduced by 1. And in this case, you have a plus sign, and then you have the minus sum of three powers reduced by 1, and so on and so on, until we exhaust all r being reduced by 1. Okay, how about the expansion for sigma n and here you will very quickly see why this expansion is useful because if we just focus on the highest two term of each bracket so each bracket will obviously have at least two terms because the power is at least one so you minimally have one plus p1 okay so you minimally have two terms in the bracket so let's focus on the highest two terms and you see that it is the highest power itself and one less than that, right? So if you expand this whole thing and just focus on the terms contributed by the highest two terms, firstly, you get taking, uh, you get the term from taking all the highest power, which is n itself. Then you have the term where for one of the brackets, you take the second highest, but for the rest of the bracket, you take the highest term. So you get plus sum of the the term here but one of the power is reduced by one similarly you can look at the, the terms you get by picking two of the brackets as the second largest term but the rest of brackets you take the largest term so you get plus sum of terms where the two of the powers are reduced by one plus dot dot plus dot dot and so on then of course this is greater than the left side is greater than equal to this right side because uh in this expression here, I'm just only focusing on the highest two terms from each bracket. And now you see the beauty of this expression and this expression. Now firstly, if we compare the left side with the right side, this is n, this is n, the 2n here cancels the 2n. And then secondly, the negative and plus cancels, same here, the negative and plus cancel. So we are left with just the plus terms, plus terms here and so on. And we need this plus terms to be bounded below by 8 if we were to even have a chance at being a solution, right? If it's already, if this plus this is already bigger than 8, then, well, 5n plus sigma n is going to be bigger than 2n plus 8. Now, this is a really useful observation because now we can see that if r is bigger than equal to 3, why is r? r is the number of distinct prime factors. So if there are at least 3 distinct prime factors, this part is not going to be empty. Because out of at least 3 prime factors, uh, I, can, I have the terms here where 2 of the powers are reduced by 1. So there's r choose 2 terms over here, at least 3 choose 2. Okay, so at least 3 terms. And each of the term is obviously at least 2, right? Because you have the each of term minimally has some prime factor inside it. So at least three terms in this part here and at least uh, each term is at least of size two and you have this plus this. So together these terms are already at least 12, very easily cross the threshold of eight. So we can conclude that there is no solution if r is at least three. 
well, quite sneaky and quite slick uh, argument over here. So it shows that R must be equal 1 or 2. At least you know when it's 1 or 2, this part is already dead. The sum stops even earlier. Okay, so now we have greatly reduced the problem, but we are not fully there yet. Let us now consider the harder case if R equals 2. What happens? So I can write N in the simpler form now, P to the A times Q to the B. And as before, this is the formula for phi n. And if I expand out, you will see here, right, this is the original n. Then minus the sum of terms where my power is reduced by 1 in one of the terms. And then plus uh, the, this term where I reduce both powers by 1. And of course, sigma n, I'm just going to you know have this times this. And again, if I just focus on the top two terms, then you will get these terms over here. Remember this minus, plus, minus, plus, they are going to cancel. Okay, these two are going to be 2n. And then this part is the one that stacked up earlier. Now this time I'm not going to do the inequality. I'm just going to write plus others for potentially if there are more terms here, then there will be plus others. So this plus others could also be empty if the sum stops here and here. Okay. Now, yeah, so I already mentioned the minus plus minus plus cancel and this part cancels with the 2n. So what we want is this part over here that are not cancelled is equal to 8. Now, if a equals b equals 1, then there's no others. The sum stops here and stops here. And this part and this part are each equals to 1. So you have 2 equals to 8. There is no solution. Now, otherwise, at least one of the terms is bigger than 1. So let's say a is bigger than or equal to 2. Okay. Now, when a is bigger than or equal to 2, what happens? Well, firstly, I know that there's at least a p to the a minus 2 term here. So I'm going to expand the p to the a minus 2 into qb and q to the b minus 1 to get these two terms here. And then I still have potentially plus others, which represents the uh, contributions if there are things remaining in the sum and we expand that bracket, okay? So what happens here now is I have four terms and we can very easily organize them by taking out the common factor and we see that the sum of these four terms is given by this. What is the smallest value that this can be? Well, just looking at this part it is at least 1, obviously. Then the smallest this can be is if it's 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1, which is already 8. So this is greater than or equal to 8 with equality if and only if Q is 3, P is 2, and this is 1, meaning A is 2 and B is 1. So basically N equals 2 squared 3 to the 1. And just coincidentally, when that happens, the others is going to be empty as well. So indeed, when n equals to 12, this whole part here that is not cancelled out is equals to 8. So n equals to 12 is the only solution for the case r equals 2. Phew. And now finally, r equals 1. This is the easy case. We let n equals p to the a and we just directly write out the formula for phi n directly write out the expression for sigma n and if we add the two together this part cancels the two n this cancels this we have the remaining p to the a minus two plus dot dot plus one equals to eight and you can very quickly check that the only possible solution is seven plus one equals to eight which implies that p is seven a is three so n equals seven cubed which is three four three yeah, so this is quite a problem for the first problem of the second day of the Korean Math Olympiad. So nonetheless, it is a short little solution with one main step. So I hope you found the problem to be quite an interesting one. Do stay tuned to the channel for more math videos and I will see you in the next one.